Mais tout de suite, j'ai le plaisir d'accueillir Denis Marchildon, qui est directeur chez SAS, qui va vous présenter votre premier conférencier. Alors, je vous remercie et je vous souhaite une excellente matinée. Merci. Bon matin à tous. Alors, c'est toujours une grande fierté pour SAS de s'associer à ces rendez-vous CMO Les Affaires. La fonction marketing se transforme à vitesse grand V. Je pense que c'est ce qui fait que tout le monde est ici ce matin. Et euh, au cœur de ça, il y a l'approche à « Know your customer » ou la vue, en fait, 360 degrés des clients qui euh, mettent au défi l'équipe marketing de mieux connaître le comportement des clients euh, aujourd'hui et surtout de mieux prévoir son comportement futur pour ainsi pouvoir répondre aux attentes grandissantes d'une clientèle qui est toujours plus exigeante et volatile. L'analytique avancée est notre cœur de métier chez SAS et nous travaillons avec les CMO de tous les horizons. Et aujourd'hui, je dois vous avouer qu'il est fascinant de voir comment les technologies viennent en fait alimenter cette transformation de la fonction marketing. Et c'est dans ce contexte qu'il me fait grandement plaisir aujourd'hui de vous présenter notre conférencier, Mr. Manoj Finelon, who is the Director of Foresight for the Global Beverages Group at PepsiCo. Manoj helps imagine desirable futures for PepsiCo's beverage brands and businesses. He's also part of a burgeoning movement keen on creating new value at the intersection of business and societal needs. Beneath the turbulence manifest on the daily news, Manoj perceives a tectonic shift that is pushing the meaning of business closer to the, meaning, the business of meaning. He sees changing societal definitions of success spurring companies to realize new value by creating platforms that help people live meaningful lives and by catalyzing large-scale social change. Manoj hails from the south of India and holds, gingerly, degrees in communication science and management studies. He has spent the last decade being professionally curious about people, what they buy, and why. Manoj is also a First Mover Fellow at the Aspen Institute's Business and Society Program and a frequent, frequent speaker at Foresight and Trend Conferences. Please welcome Manoj Finelon. Bonjour. That's about all the French I know. You'll have to excuse me. Ah, wow, it's a big room. Okay. okay. So you've heard about me. You know that I work for PepsiCo. Um, I work for PepsiCo. I'm very happy. I think the company is very happy with me. But. Um, whatever I say here, please don't take it as the official position of PepsiCo on anything. And I'll briefly explain to you why. Um, you know, Pep PepsiCo is a huge company, and I very much represent PepsiCo here, and I'm proud to be here. But at the same time, as you all know in your own companies, there's a lot of conversations happening because of change, because change freaks us out. Am I allowed to say that? I don't know what the French equivalent of that is. And we're all trying to have conversations about how to respond to change. And I am part of that conversation. I'm officially part of that conversation. But while the conversation is still going, I feel a little uncomfortable about presenting, you know, whatever I'm about to present to you as the official position of PepsiCo on anything, because it's still being formed, yeah? So especially for the media people in here, I have no objections to you quoting me, but Manoj thinks, Manoj says is okay. PepsiCo thinks, PepsiCo says not so much. You'll get me into trouble. So with that out of the way, um, what I wanted to do, if you could just bring up the first slide um, in the show. I, I wanted it to stay up as, as part of the introduction to me. That's a little bit of how I think. I think that's me, that, that figure over there. And I've, you know, I've been in this business for about 10 or 12 years, and I find myself standing there looking at the world and thinking exactly that. So that's a little bit of what I want to talk to you about today. What is that feeling all about, and why? Why today? And what are you all supposed to do with that? Yeah? Sounds like a plan? OK. Um, I, I was told that French Canadians um, 
are different from the rest of Canada uh, in lots of ways probably that I will discover. But one of the ways was that they're not afraid to express their opinions. And I said, yes, thank God, that, that fits my style, so I won't be shy. Um, I want to start by insulting all of you <laughs> and what you do, uh, but I will hide behind a video to do that. Yeah, it's a little safer. So can we play the video, please? It's a very short video. It's about two and a half minutes long. I think you'll enjoy this. We think first of vague words that are synonyms for progress and pair them with footage of a high-speed train. Science is doing lots of stuff that may or may not have anything to do with us. See how this guy in a lab coat holds up a beaker? That means we do research. Here's a picture of DNA. There are a shitload of people in the world, especially in India. See how we're part of the global economy? Look at those farmers in China. But we also do business in the USA, or want you to think we do. Check out this wind energy thing in Indiana and this blue collar guy with dirt on his face. Also, we care about the environment, loosely. Here's some powerful rushing water and people planting trees. Our policies could be related to these panoramic views of Costa Rica. In today's high-speed environment, stop-motion footage of a city at night with cars turning quickly makes you think about doing things efficiently and time passing. Lest you think we're a faceless entity, look at all these attractive people. Hear some of them talking and laughing and close-ups of hands passing canned goods to each other in a setting that evokes community service. Equality, innovation, honesty, and advancement are all words we choose from a list. Our prophets are awe-inspiring, like this guy who's looking up and pointing at a skyscraper or a kite while smiling and explaining something to his child. Using a specific ratio of Asian people to black people to women to white men, we want to make sure we represent your needs and interests, or at least a version of your skin color in our ads. Did we put a baby in here? What about an ethnic old man whose wrinkled smile represents the happiness and wisdom of the poor? Yep. Okay, nobody's throwing anything at me so far. That's good. It's a good start. How do you all like that? Point, prompt some self-reflection, yeah? Uh, hopefully, for the, for the rest of the day at least. So I want to start with a proposition, um, and Mark asked me to be provocative. If anything else, he said, I don't really care what you say, but be provocative. So let me start with a very provocative proposition. Marketing is useless. Has become useless. And I want to spend the next half hour or so before the panel comes on after me to sort of explain why I said that, yeah? Because it's a, it's a pretty shocking statement. Um, so the first thing you point to is data. You know, everybody knows this. When you make a statement like that, the next slide, it better be some data, otherwise people are gonna be throwing something at you. I am, I am, I don't, we don't need data to know this. I think I saw a lot of you chuckling or kind of thinking back to what you all do in your lives and how much that video sort of pokes at you a little bit, yeah? Um, but while we have data, let's have it. Right? This is a Nielsen Global Survey. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this. It's about three years old. I can guarantee you nothing has changed in the last three years. It's probably gotten worse. But this slide basically shows what people around the globe think of influences on their, ad, on their purchase decisions especially with respect to how relevant the information is, depending on the source, yeah? And no surprises, advertising is somewhere at the bottom of the list, and people, real people, are at the top of the list. 
we move on to the question of trust, pretty much the same thing. People say, if a friend of mine tells me about something, yeah, I trust them. If some big company or small company or advertiser tells me about something, I don't really t trust them that much. So you go, okay, advertising or marketing in general is not helping with being relevant in terms of providing information, and it's not trusted when it's relevant. So it makes perfect sense that marketing is useless, because if you can provide relevant information or be trusted in people's decision-making processes, what the hell are we doing? Yeah? Um, so, but let's, let's have some fun examples as well. Um, I don't mean this particular uh, piece of advertising, but I wanted to pull this up just to add some texture, you know? This comes from a company that spent around, I hope nobody from the company is here, but you know, this is not just about this company, I could say the same thing about my own company, lots of other companies. This company spent around $445 million in advertising in 2012. That's a huge amount, yeah? Um, and their sales have been declining for the last 10 years. I think their market share now is about 50% of what it used to be 10 years ago. Just stop line thing. Contrast that to this company. By, by the way, the previous one, I'm sure you figured out who that was. This one, I don't know if you can see the brand in the lower left corner on the can. Does anyone recognize this product? Yes. Pabst Blue Ribbon. Yeah, lots, lots of Canadian fans of PBR. There's fans of PBR all over the place. This company, and most of you know this, I think, since 1985 has a policy of not advertising. Has a policy of not advertising. They haven't advertised since 1985. They do a lot of word of mouth marketing. I'm making a point about advertising, but I want to make it about marketing in general. So how do we reconcile this stuff? And this company has been growing for the last six years. Okay, they're still about a third of the size of Budweiser, but still growth over the last six years in a tough market. In, in the States without any advertising? What the hell's going on? And these guys have figured out the group that everyone else is trying to figure out and scratching their heads over, the millennials. Um, and it's even debatable if these people have actually figured them out. You know, it could be sort of a default thing, which leads me to my next point, which is not very well connected. But I wanted to also bring this up. This is how absurd marketing has gotten. This is one of the most wanted products uh, in Montreal today, maybe. There are versions of this for almost any sports team in North America, and they're all selling like hotcakes. And they're called ugly sweaters. Officially, I mean, that, I pulled that from the website for the Montreal Canadiens. The official name of the item is an ugly sweater, and it will cost you 75 Canadian dollars uh, or something, and people are buying these up. You know, so, this is a little bit of a joke, but I want to say the state of the world we live in is absurd. You know, we have brands that are spending millions of dollars not getting anything for it. There's brands who have a policy of not advertising and they're doing well. And then you have people selling ugly sweaters. This is clearly a very absurd world. So I want to get a little bit serious for a second. And I'll, you know, I'm not a very, uh, I shouldn't say this. I was going to say I'm not a very structured person, but I am. I just have a different sense of structure. Maybe a French-Canadian kind of structure, you know? So I'm going to throw out a number of provocations from here on, and then I'll just close, and then we can all talk about it, yeah? So the first provocation, I want to make an analogy. I think the relationship of marketing to business has become like the relationship of what's called the FIRE sector of the economy. I don't know if you use that acronym here. It's basically finance, insurance, and real estate, yeah? F-I-R-E. Uh, what that sector has become to the overall economy, which in a word is the relationship of a parasite to the host body. Yeah? So it's almost like marketing is eating business from the inside out, just like the way finance and insurance and that part of the economy is eating the economy from the inside out. Another way to look at it without all the gross metaphors, I realize some of you are still having breakfast, is to think about it as marketing has become disconnected from the rest of the universe in which it's supposed to operate. Just like finance, which was supposed to help fund the real economy, now is in an economy of its own, and the rest of the economy is sitting here going, hey, where's the money? 
and finance is doing its own thing within its own universe. So I just wanted to put that analogy out um, as a disturbing one. There's also, well, I'm in Montreal, so I have to be a little philosophical, you know, and quote some French philosophy. But this is not a new problem. I think it was predicted, in a sense, foreseen, might be a better way to put it, 40 years ago by this man, Guy Debord. Uh, and he talked about this idea of the spectacle. And for him, the spectacle was a universe unto itself that was very disconnected from the rest of the world. It was a world of surfaces. And any time you look around and see a colleague today, just immersed in the world of surfaces, and I'm not referring to Microsoft Surface, just surfaces in general, uh, I think you should remember what this man had to say about the world we live in, spectacle, and how much marketing is a part of that. But there is also an antidote to this spectacle, I think. And I want to introduce you to a, I think this is a still, from a movie that came out during the 1970s. I think the name of the movie was They Live. It's by John Carpenter. And there's a scene in the movie where, I think it's a homeless person, don't quote me on this, go watch the movie, um, wakes up puts on these special glasses that somebody has given them. It's part of the plot of the movie. And what these glasses allow that person to do is to see everything around them but have the ideology behind them unmasked, if you will. So they look out at billboards. They look out at everything in the world around them, marketing, essentially. And they see the one way of looking at it is hidden messages or the underlying message, right? And it looks something like this irrespective of what the actual advertisement is for. It could be for airlines, it could be for beer, it could be for condoms, I don't know. Uh, but this is the underlying message and this is what it looks like. And this is where I think it gets really serious. I think a large part of the world is starting to wear those glasses now. Uh, and that's why we're all sitting here going, well, let's see what Manoj has to say about, let's, let's all think together about how to respond to this world. I think we're all, as marketers, responding to a world in which people have those glasses on. Um, and we're no longer in this relationship of like, ah, we can tell them how to live their lives, which is, in a way, what we've been doing. Um, and that has to change. Well, good question. What does it change to, right? Um, and I want to present you a current paradox. The best way to sell anything today is to tap into that. Is to tap into that. It's a very profound feeling today in the world. Um, you could say, well, it's kind of like the North American thing. People are fed up of advertising. They see about 3,500 advertising messages a day or marketing messages a day. They're fed up, so this is much more of a North American phenomenon. If you go to a India, I come from India, by the way, or a China or a Mexico, people don't think like this. People are like, give me life advice, you marketers of the world. That's what we think. I, I, I think it's changing over there and faster than we could believe or want to believe. Or it might change in different ways that we haven't anticipated. So I want to leave you with that. And also, actually, let me, let me go back. Um, I want to end by throwing out, so I've presented a problem to you clearly now. And you go, well, you came all the way from New York to tell me we have a problem, and you're just going to go away. That doesn't seem very friendly. So I thought, I don't have any specific answers, by the way. But what I would throw out is four, um, Two of them are bits of explanation. Two of them are suggestions about what we could all do as marketers to evolve, yeah? So I'll just throw them out and see what you think. So the first one is by way of explanation. This looks very complicated, but in future studies, one of the things we try to overcome is when people think about the future, they think of it as a one-curve problem, if you will. Sorry to get a little mathematical on you. Uh, by which I mean, People assume that the future is on a line like this. We're somewhere here, it's called now. The future is somewhere over here, and you try to figure out what the path is from here to there. That all works in a time when everything is kind of calm. You can use a lot of history to extrapolate what's gonna happen in the future, which is essentially what we've been doing, right? You kind of look at the past three years, if you're lucky, six months, if you're not so lucky, and then try to see what the next six months are going to look like, or the next three years, et cetera, et cetera. 
But what if we're living in a turbulent world, which I don't think I'll get any argument from people. We are living in a turbulent world. The question is, what is causing that turbulence? This is from a think tank in the US, one of the best ones, in my opinion, uh, at least working in civil society, called the Institute for the Future. And they say a very interesting and useful way to think about the future is it's a problem of two curves, by which they mean we're in the middle of a great transition. It's not just a marketing transition or a business transition, it's a world transition, which also means it's really hard to describe succinctly what those transitions represent, but I will try because I put that slide up. So think of it as industrial civilization is basically on its last legs. Yeah, provocative statement, but I'll say it. Um, and something is emerging to replace that slowly, not clear in some parts, very clear in other parts. And it's that emerging curve is hard to name. Yeah, we don't know what it is yet. We can't give it a label. But the curve that's declining, I would venture that a good amount of people in this room are part of businesses that are on that curve, that are looking to the future and seeing nothing but this for all sorts of reasons. Could be sustainability, could be generational changes, could be people are changing the way they approach products and services, lots of reasons. But there is a paradigm that's declining and there's a paradigm that's growing and nobody really knows what's gonna happen in the middle, yeah? For lots of reasons, I'll just give you one example. I know that the current model of industrial production cannot survive, let's say in 2100, just cannot. And I'll be very clear about saying that because there are estimates saying, so people go, well, if growth in North America is declining, there's the rest of the world. Okay, here's the problem with that. If the rest of the world, or even small parts of it, like China, which is not very small, consumes at anything close to the Western middle class way of consuming, we will need four and a half planets worth of resources to satisfy that demand. There's a lot of people, there are some people, especially in Silicon Valley, that think that technology is the answer to this. I'm not one of them. Um, so when I look out, that just seems unsustainable. It cannot happen and will not happen. So something else has to take its place, no? But how that transition is gonna happen, nobody really knows. But the interesting thing about nobody really knows is it's all up to each one of us and the companies we represent and the efforts that we do. So it's not like something is going to happen to us. We're gonna have a hand in shaping how this transition happens. And what I wanted to quickly point out is there are some characteristics that we can identify of what's declining and what's growing. Things like control, secrecy, this issue of intellectual property or efficiency, top-down management styles, they're all in decline. And we see this in a number of industries, not just in industry, in government, in civil society as well. And characteristics of the emerging paradigm are exactly the opposite principles. You know? So there's a lot more openness, WikiLeaks, for example, uh, transparency, more participatory stuff. You can almost imagine a LinkedIn group that you're part of being the company of the future. And think about it, you need all the people you have. You all came together voluntarily. You're clearly interested and passionate about working with each other. Why can't you be in business just as a group? Well, yes, you need resources and all of that, but you can figure that out. What you have is much more powerful than what companies that have disparate groups of people that they've hired are trying to create, you know, in terms of teams. It's a very interesting way to think about what's changing in the world. So that's a little bit by way of explanation backdrop. Another very, uh, I will refer you to this white paper. It's clearly hard to see, uh, but the basic point of this thing is that we're entering new econ economic paradigms, economic paradigms, yeah? So the first two, if you could see the blue and the purple one, kind of represent what we've been through so far. The last two, the one in the orange and the one in the green, are the ones that are emerging, and I'll briefly talk about two of them. The one in the orange is very easy to figure out. The world is going from a central provider of something, a typical big business case, right? You have a big business, you have a huge market, you kind of segment them into distinct types, and then you figure out how to talk to each one of them because they're all distinct. That's breaking down. The world is much more a world where people are talking to each other and we're all sitting here going, where do I fit into this? What is my role? Yeah, so that's one kind of economy. People call it a knowledge economy where the things that are being sold now are not products and services, they're actually information 
is the real commodity that's being exchanged. And the last one is the one that, in the introduction, Denise mentioned about my interest in social change. I think companies have to become part of social change. It's not an option anymore. You're going from a world where you saw business as a separate circle and the world as a separate circle, and we used to draw all these cute arrows saying, this is the supply chain and this is marketing, and now you're getting into a world where there's one big circle called the universe, and business is a part of that. So all of the problems in society automatically become business problems. I think that's going to be the way to think about it in the future. So all this begs the question, what is the new role of marketing? We understood the role of marketing very clearly in the first two paradigms, yeah? Persuasion, sell, change people's minds, change people's hearts. We're, we're all familiar with that, and that's what we do today. What do we do in a world where people are selling each other on stuff? Yeah? In a world where the most trusted person for information and for relevance is not you, the marketer, it's us as people. What is the role of the marketer then? We have to think very differently. Um, yeah? And in terms of social change as well, there's new roles for marketing. We might have to move away from what we used to call advertising to something that I would call advocacy which is taking a stand about an issue that people are concerned about, a stand that represents your business interests as well. I'm not talking about the kind of what we call cause marketing, you know, where you're a person that manufactures beer, but along comes March or May and everybody's wearing pink ribbons and there's pink bottles and there's pink everything. What the hell does beer have to do with, you know, breast cancer? I don't know, maybe there is a link, but people aren't talking about it. I'm talking more about advocacy in the sense of there is a business, there is a societal interest embedded in your business. It could be making people have fun. It could be showing people the value of luxury. It could also be helping people get more water. It could be helping people travel. It could be connecting people. Whatever that interest is, how do you advocate for that in a way that's not about selling people on something, but just talking about the need for that in the world and what that means to people, and how people can almost join a movement around that. Yeah? Uh, this sounds abstract, but I would point you to what Chipotle is doing with sustainable farming and food in the US as a good example of a company that's moving away from advertising to something like advocacy. The last two examples are more fun, I think. Um, I think one of the ways that marketing needs to evolve, and I'm seeing this in my own company, is marketers, there's a new name for marketers these days. Anybody wants to guess? It starts with a D. It starts with a D. Designers. It's one way to think about it. I know there's a huge design community. I'm not as familiar with Montreal, but Toronto, for example. And it's not a coincidence. I think there's something happening there. And there's a lot of bleeding between marketing and design. You, you can't tell. You, somebody walks into a room, you can't tell, well, what do you do? Is it marketing? Is it design? Is it some combination of two? So I would say that that's one of the ways we need to think about evolving. And I use this example. It's a local example, by the way, a fantastic small startup, I think. I don't think they're that small anymore. It's called Molecule R. I don't know if you've heard of it. So this is a new product that they put out. It's called the Aroma Fork. And they're talking about introducing new tastes to food, not by affecting the food itself, but by affecting the aroma that comes out of that small circle just before the food. Yeah. It's an interesting way to think about it. And I use this example because I think one of the paradigms that we need to break, and I wish I could draw something, I think there's a general relationship in marketing where you go, you have attributes of a product or service, you have an immediate benefit that most of us worry about, and then you have kind of a life benefit, you know? So, okay, beer is smooth, it's dark, it's uh, caramelly, those are the attributes. It's more refreshing, or it's easier to drink, or it's more stylish is the immediate benefit. And something like, you know, I'm a cool person because I drink this beer, sort of that life benefit. No? There's two huge disruptions to that chain that are going to make all of us think very differently. First of all, this new discipline, it's not really that new, behavioral economics, is changing how we thought about the relationship between attributes and the benefit. Uh, it turns out that most of what our marketing research and insights people have been telling us, they haven't been lying to us, but it's completely false. There's a Nobel Prize winning person who stood up last year and said, this is not the way human beings think and behave. 
So now we all have to change our ideas about what are, what are we really selling? What are the attributes that actually matter to people? So that's one disruption. The other disruption, which again was hinted at in my introduction, is people, what success and happiness means to people is changing, yeah? And you've seen this in your own lives maybe. You're not as much attracted by this sort of corner office and becoming the C of something as you used to before. Maybe, I'm speculating. Or the idea of spending more time with your kids or your loved ones is taking on much more importance to you than other things, whatever they might be, like uh, luxury products. And this is happening everywhere at all levels of society. Yeah? So the normal marketing relationship of going up the chain and saying, well, I got this, check there, check there, let's launch an advertising campaign or a marketing strategy, is all upside down now. You'll have to think very differently about this. And this is one of the ways where behavioral economics is telling people, if you really want to investigate the new relationship or the old relationship in a new way between what are the attributes of the product or service that you have and what people really respond to, you need to get far behind what people say. And I was having a conversation briefly with someone who is going to experiment with getting deep into what people feel, you know, sort of the almost primordial relationships between your product or your category and people's reactions. And there's new help on the way, which I think will turn a lot of marketers into designers once they start to appreciate that. And the last thing that I will say is I want to show you an example and let the example speak for itself about how a brand can be really, really cool and do exceptional marketing in a sense, but the marketing is also the product and it's all about a good thing in the world. So I introduced you to this brand called Casa del Agua, the house of water. It's a it's a rainwater bar. It's a very accurate technical description, and I will show you. So that's what the brand looks like, you know, T-shirts, bags, etc. But this is, what, this is the only place so far I think they have plans to expand. This is the rainwater bar in one of the coolest neighborhoods in Mexico City. This is what it looks like on top. It's a beautiful garden. It's free for people to go sit there, read a book. They grow herbs there. But... The, the little green that you see in the first picture on the left side, which looks like a lawn, is actually a specially made natural fiber that acts as the first filter for rainwater. So it rains a lot in Mexico City. Some of you are thinking, oh, Mexico City is one of the most polluted places on Earth. What are they doing there with rainwater? Turns out, this is an interesting factoid, the first 10 minutes of rain contain 90% of the atmospheric pollutants. So if you find a way to ignore the first 10 minutes of rain, and then you're sort of okay. But anyway, this place has a fantastic filtration thing behind the back. And at the bottom, they sell bottled, filtered, harmonized, and they have a way of doing that, rainwater, with the herbs that they grew on top, infused. So, you know, it's a small business. It's not going to threaten the likes of PepsiCo or Coca-Cola anytime soon. But I wanted to point it out as an example of this is ecosystem engineering, this is eco-consciousness, this is sustainability, this is sharing economy. There's all sorts of cool things going on, but they don't talk about it that way. They talk about it as a really cool brand that's just trying to sell rainwater from Mexico. Um, it means something to me that this is the direction in which the world's headed. I will leave it to all of you to decide what that means to you. But thank you so much for having me and for giving me this time to just think and be free in a way that I'm not very often in the office. So thank you so much. Merci. I believe you stay right here with me. <laughs> we're uh, we're going to have a, uh, a short Q&A session, if you're OK with that, Manoj. Um, wow. I thought I could just um, get away. So this is, today is the third uh, rendezvous CMO that we are holding. And the first two ones talked a lot about agile marketing, integration of the roles of CMO and CIO. A lot of things that I believe people in this room could relate to. Um, you used the word provocative, and I'm going to go as far as saying that you're shaking the foundation a little bit. Um, so, 
I will um, ask uh, people in the audience, uh, we have a couple of microphones in the center of the room. Uh, if you want to stand up and uh, ask uh, any questions to Manoj, uh, feel free to ask them in French. We'll do the translating for you if you feel more comfortable that way. Uh, all insults are welcome. This is Quebec, after all. Um, no, seriously, if you don't agree with something, I think that could be a very useful starting point, too. That was just terrible. I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> thank you for the inspiring uh, presentation. I have a question. So all this provocative thinking, um, can you give us an example of how you integrate that at Pepsi PepsiCo? I might have to swear you to secrecy. Thank you. Um, OK, I'll give an example that's not controversial, I think. One of the things that I'm trying to do personally, which is a struggle within the company, I won't lie about it, but it has a lot of support and we're trying to work through the challenges, is to integrate what we do in sustainability. Um, so I'll give, you, I'll give you an example of water. Yeah, And I'm not revealing any company secrets here. Um, we do a lot of stuff on water under the sustainability group, which works out of operations in the company. So it's part of the manufacturing setup. They save water in plants. They clean bottles with high-pressured air instead of water. Saves a lot of water. They treat wastewater and use a lot of wastewater back in the plants. Some of our plants are even zero. Um, not emissions, but water wastage, you know? So there's that stuff. Then we have a foundation, the PepsiCo Foundation, that does a lot of grants, mostly in the, I hate this phrase, developing world, but I'll use it anyway, um, in India, in Ghana, places like that. And then we have a water business that I'm sure all of you are familiar with called Aquafina. Uh, to me, this is absurd because you have parts of the company that are doing really cool stuff that win awards at the UN that get a lot of social, uh, how do you call it? a social following as, wow, PepsiCo is doing interesting stuff. None of that affects purchase decisions for our brand of water. There's a lot of legal reasons why. You know, the foundation, for example, is legally prohibited from doing anything to benefit the business because it's part of tax laws. So it's not without challenge. But one of the things we're trying to do is to see what would a PepsiCo business, not charity, not nonprofit stuff, what would a PepsiCo business look like on water that combines the best parts of all three, that's sustainable, that does some good for communities everywhere and still makes money? Um, and I think people, I hesitate to say people haven't thought about this before, but I think people were too accepting of all the boundaries that were there. I'm saying, oh, that's operations, this is marketing. You know, arranging a meeting between operations marketing, some of you know how hard that is. Uh, so that's the kind of stuff that we're trying to do, I think, within, within this new frame. Donald Bid, uh, Cedron. Uh, I was intrigued by that lead-in from the meaning of business to the business of meaning. So in that context, what's the relationship between innovation and meaning? And what is, in your view, truly profound, uh, truly authentic uh, in innovation? Re no, really good question, I think. I wish I knew the answer to that. I'm going to go have a croissant. Uh, no, but thank you. Uh, that's one of the topics that's very dear to me. Let me, uh, I'll be very short in my answer, and then if you want to respond to that, we can talk about it. I think innovation is going to be more about the how than the what, is one way of putting it. What I mean by that is, um, if we say marketing helps people relate to businesses and brands, I think marketing is generally tended to focus on the what, you know, and innovation as well. So there's a lot of talk in the company about what do I do in my company? It's a bottle, you know? So people are looking at bottles all day. What can I change about this, inside this, the bottom at the top, you know? And we've exhausted all the possibilities. There is no more innovation to be done. Uh, you can remove the bottle. That would be a good innovation, I think. Uh, but apart from that, there's very little to do, you know? But what does water mean to people? Or what does liquid mean to people? What does milk mean to people? Yeah, There's lots of opportunities. I was just talking to um, 
you know, a person who represents the dairy industry, and one of their big challenges, I hope you don't mind me disclosing this, is, you know, people, milk is sort of like a default. People don't think about it enough. You know, people don't have a relationship with milk, you might say, especially the ones growing up now. And you know all the reasons why, because people have crazy times in the morning, they don't eat breakfast anymore, a glass of milk is just seen as like, ah. Um, but changing that, that could be innovation. Creating a new relationship between something that's existed since, you know, and a new generation of people, that nobody thinks about this as innovation, I think. Uh, because it's not classified as such, you know, unless you're adding something to milk and making it orange, that's innovation, it's orange milk. But changing an entire generation's relationship to milk is not considered innovation. It's, eh, it's just a marketing campaign, it's like another round of advertising. And I think people have to think more about, I actually hate the word, the noun form of innovation. This is not an original thing. I, had a, I used to work for a guy once who came from Nike, and I said, this word surprises me. We should be talking about innovative, you know? It's an action, it's doing something differently. It's not about the thing itself that you're changing is innovation. And I think it just opens up the possibilities. You know? So a lot of the innovation I think is gonna come from considering the how. It's almost like building new relationships is going to be the new innovation. Forget about the thing. The thing will fall out of the relationship you're trying to build. That will lead you to what new things you may or may not want to create. But the innovation is going to come from forming new relationships. Sorry if all my answers are so long. <laughs> I've had too much coffee. Um, anybody else? If not, I do have, oh, I see somebody standing up being so provocative and so inspiring. I have uh, a question regarding your, your, uh, your saying that uh, uh, innovation is part of doing something different. It's also uh, being disruptive. It's also uh, being, just being different mm -hmm. in the company and in the world. So how do you handle being different within your own company? Because it seems to be a little difficult to be free. So thank you for your answer. Thank you for the question. I run away to Montreal. <laughs> Simple answer, it's just an hour away. Um, the, the truest thing that's been said about me in my entire professional career, which is about 20 years, I think, is came from my CEO, so that's good support to have. Um, she wrote an email to me congratulating me on something or the other, I forget now, and she used the word, we need more internal activists like you. I still haven't asked her what she meant by that. I was so happy with the statement. I was like, ah, I don't care what she meant by that. Um, no, I, I think I know. I think um, PepsiCo is a company, and I'll say two very good things about PepsiCo. They take diversity seriously, uh, to the extent that, you know, Montreal's a very diverse place. I'm looking at this crowd, it's a fairly diverse crowd. So there's that kind of, you know, visible diversity. Well, yeah, there's good gender balance, there's ethnic balance, all of that. And PepsiCo, the leadership ranks especially reflect that. But I also think we don't stop thinking about diversity, you know? We're thinking about, so one of the, one of the quotas under which I fit in is diversity of thinking. People who don't think like anyone who's been to an MBA program or a business school or worked for 20 years in business. I, haven't, I don't have an MBA, uh, which is why I wrote in my, I hate education in general. Edu the education that I had was deeply traumatic. Uh, not just business education, education in general. So that's a different story, maybe a different talk. Um, so I, I like the fact that I'm considered useful to the company, you know, which wasn't always the case. Uh, so that's one way I survive. And I think um, as, you know, sort of the change aspect of it, I think 10 years ago or even five years ago, most of the people that I talked to would have heard me, but just out of politeness, would have dismissed me because their business was doing fairly well. They didn't have that many problems. Or if they had problems, they knew who to call. And nowadays, I talk to the very same people, have the very same conversations that I was having with them five years ago, and the meetings last an hour and a half. Um, I don't know what it is. I don't think it's just me. I think it's a lot of confusion on the other side as well. So I try to take advantage of these two things. Uh, it's not nearly enough, so I have to escape quite a bit as well. I try to spend as much time away from 
the office. Not because I don't like the office, because I think it's really important to be out in the world. Thank you. Thank you. I, I actually do have a final question before we wrap this up. Um, you talked about a number of things um, towards the end, advertising to advocacy, marketers to designers, and then you talked about behavioral economics. Uh, understanding our customers' behaviors, um, how do you achieve that? And I'd like to hint that technology to do that, but knowing that technology is, doesn't seem to be your answer, like how, how do you go about having that intimate understanding of customer behaviors? Um, I, I certainly didn't want to come across as, you know, the previous speakers you've had and all the things that they've probably said. I don't think any of that is wrong. What I hope to have done is provide sort of like a superstructure under which you can look at all of those techniques and stuff and decide when and where and how to use them. So I'll just say that. Uh, with respect to technology, I think three things. First, please stop calling customers customers or consumers. They're people. <laughs> yeah. It, it might sound like a trivial thing, but I think when we say customers or consumers, we're interested in two seconds of a person's life in my category. Uh, for some of you, it might be longer, maybe a couple of hours if you're working in real estate or something, and people take time to think about a house. But it's still a narrow slice of the full person. And in a previous paradigm where we used to dissect everything and have this very mechanical way of thinking about the world, that was okay. Now we're realizing that the world's not mechanical. I'm sorry, but you know, the world's not mechanical. The world is ecological. Everything is connected. We know this from our own experience. So it doesn't make sense to be talking about consumers or customers, people, which leads you to a whole host of techniques and new ways of going about it. The thing that I talked about of being outside in the world, I would encourage a lot more people to do. You know, uh, I don't know about you, I think Canadian society is different, but in America there's so much of a gap between the average person who works at a Fortune 500 company, let's say, or you know, fairly big company, who lives in the suburbs, who's got the, all the kinds of things that you probably see in American TV shows, and most of the people who are buying the products that they sell. They just don't share the same worlds. You know? So yes, you can have a lot of market research and insights, but nothing substitutes from a sort of like intuitive understanding of the world that's sharpened every day, that evolves every day. And I'm not saying this is the only answer. I think it's a good compliment. Thirdly, and lastly, I would say the new, uh, again, I hate buzzwords, but this one is a really interesting one, I think. The new uh, goal of research and understanding is not so much understanding per se, but it's empathy. Yeah? It's sort of this idea of like, can I put myself in the other person's shoes? And I worked in market research for a long time. I think even the best research from back then didn't do that. It gave you some sort of understanding. It was like reading a news item. You know, you would say, ah, that thing happened in Fiji or something. I read about it. It's not the same thing as trying to feel in that person's shoes facing a tsunami or wh whatever the news item was. So I think to the extent that we're pursuing, that we understand that the goal of all the activities that we do is empathy and not just understanding. Understanding is a part of it. I think we're starting to solve for really knowing people as they exist in the world more holistically and with a real feeling of connection. You know, not just a transactional relationship saying, I make money by selling this to you. That's a transaction. But you say, you buy my product, I'm in a relationship with you as a marketer. That's a very different form of relationship, I think. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you for uh, giving us something to think about today and in the days and weeks to come. Um, if there are no further questions, we'll take a, a short uh, networking break so that people can actually go and meet with other people. Thank you. Thank you so much.